Good morning, everyone. I'm actually presenting this talk on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Senthil, who is not here. So the topic is about multivessel PCI. I think there's going to be a lot of overlap uh, about multivessel disease between a few slides which were presented by Dr. Refai. Uh, so when do we call it a multivessel coronary disease? So if you have coronary artery size more than 2.5 mm in diameter, and if you have at least 70% in at least two coronary arteries, it is known as multivessel coronary disease. Otherwise, if there's 50% stenosis in left main, and there's another coronary artery involvement, that also is classified under multivessel disease. So patients having multivessel disease, nearly 40 to 88% of them present with uh, angina, which carries a mortality hazard ratio compared to single vessel disease. Also, we have both uh, PCI and CABG, which can effectively revascularize the myocardium. There has been a long-standing debate over the optimal uh, revascularization strategy for patients with multivessel disease, which is still continuing. So this is the recent uh, ACC consensus uh, in the year 2021 about the uh, multivessel revascularization. So as it was discussed already, it is all about informed consent and patient-centered care and shared decision making. So in case if the anatomy is complex and a cardiologist cannot make decision, then there has to be heart team approach where the cardiologist, the anesthetist, and also a cardiologist surgeon needs to be involved, and even the patient, the pros and cons need to be explained, the prognosis, and then the decision has to be made involving the patient. So what are the factors that needs to be considered before deciding the strategy, whether let it be CABG or PCI? It mainly depends on the coronary anatomy, if it's a left main, multivessel disease, or a high anatomic complexity disease, which includes bifurcation or a high syntax score. Also the patient comorbids, which is diabetes, uh, the uh, left, left ventricular ejection fraction, underlying coagulopathies, if there's any concomitant valvular heart disease, other end-stage renal disease, COPD, patient with malignancies, immunosuppression, liver disease, all these are patient comorbid conditions, and also the procedural factors, which includes access site, bleeding issues, the surgical risk, and also the PCI risk, where we have various risk stratification scores, which I'll be discussing later and also the patient factors. That is, if the patient is unstable or patient is in shock or it's a stable patient, and the patient preference, the social support, the economic thing, and also the religious beliefs and their knowledge and understanding, all these things need to be taken into consideration before we make further decision. Now, coming to risk stratification, we have two risk, risk scores which have been used now. That is the STS risk score, which tells us about uh, what is the risk of the surgery. If it's less than 4%, 4 to 8, or more than 8%, which will be high risk for surgery also. And then the syntax score, which is commonly used in multivessel disease to classify the um, uh, risk uh, uh, when the patient goes for PCI. So the syntax score has uh, 11 various levels, which includes the dominance, if it's a right or left, and the coronary segment involvement, that is in each vessel, it's the proximal, mid, distal, uh, we have uh, various segments being numbered in the coronaries, and then if it's a total occlusion, and then if it's a bifurcation or a trifurcation, if there's any hostile involvement, are the vessels calcified, the length of the lesion involved, the tortuosity, the presence of thrombus, and if there's any small vessel disease. So we go through all these 11 steps, and then we calculate. So the syntax score one, we have two scores, one and two. One is only about the anatomic complexity, whereas in two, we also take into consideration the patient age, the frailty, and then the creatinine clearance, and then that gives us the mortality with PCI versus CABG, which helps us in making a decision after explaining it to the patients. So coming to the next slide, which is about the coronary physiology and imaging to decide strategy. Uh, there are various trials which have shown that, you know, imaging guided and physiology guided uh, percutaneous intervention is superior to just angiography guided. So in case of intermediate lesions, that is 60 to 70 percent or 50 to 60, where the angiography is just borderline, if we need to further make a decision, we can do FFR, which is a physiological assessment, or in case of left main, we can use an IVERS and uh, uh, make a decision if we need to revascularize that particular coronary artery or not. So now coming to STEMI, so in multivessel CAD, we have two sessions, that is patients presenting with uh, acute ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation ACS. So coming to uh, STEMI, so immediate reperfusion therapy for patients with STEMI has shown to improve mortality rate in uh, various trials and also, of course, is superior to fibrinolytic therapy. So in patients with acute STEMI, CABG has a limited role and its use in this setting continues to decrease. So various case trials also highlight that there's high mortality risk when CABG is performed early after STEMI. 
So we have like four different revascularization strategies available here. That is multivessel PCI at the time of presentation with primary PCI, and then you just treat the culprit artery followed by stage PCI of non-infarct artery, or you go for the PCI of infarct artery at the setting, and then if the others are borderline lesions, you decide about if they are related to any ischemia to the patient or not and make a decision. Or if it's a complex anatomy, multivessel disease involving left main, you can just treat the infarct artery, tide over the situation, and always send the patient for elective CABG after that. But now, various randomized trials do support the efficacy and safety of multivessel PCI in selected patients with STEMI, and there's a lot of data also supporting the same. But CABG can always be a reasonable option, reasonable option to treat the residual complex disease. So this is just one of the recent trials, which is a complete trial where patients presenting with STEMI had a, a culprit vessel treatment at the time of presentation, and over a mean duration of 28 to 45 days, they underwent non-culprit lesion PCI, uh, and complete revascularization was achieved within the next six weeks, and that showed there's a 26% lower risk of composite of cardiovascular uh, outcome uh, at the follow-up of three years, compared to only culprit lesion PCI. Now coming to multivessel PCI in STEMI in the same sitting, as I said, out of the three, four modalities, you can uh, decide, but then uh, from the previous trial, we know it's better to revascularize the rest of the vessels, also at least within six weeks duration, if possible, and achieve complete revascularization uh, so that the outcomes will be better. It, it's only when the patient's present with cardiogenic shock, we do not consider doing non-infact related PCI at the same time of presentation. Only the culprit artery is treated when the patient presents with shock, and we have enough evidence from the culprit shock trial. Now coming to patients presenting with NSTEMI and multivessel disease, so those pa uh, the same thing, the revascularization has to be based upon the patient con condition, angiographic characteristics, and also the complication, uh, complexity of the anatomy. And in patients with NSTEMI who are presenting with cardiogenic shock, routine multivessel PCA of non-culprit lesions should not be done. So now the next heading is basically the left ventricular dysfunction and multivessel CAD. So here we have strong evidence and also the class one indication that is multivessel CAD, patients presenting with ejection fraction less than 35%, CABG of course is recommended to improve survival benefit. And also those patients presenting with 35% to 50% EF and stable ischemic heart disease with multivessel disease, it is reasonable to go ahead with CABG to improve survival, but there has to be a graph from Lima to LAD. Uh, so these are various headings, that is left main and then multivessel and also in patients with diabetes or non-diabetic. So if patients have significant left main stenosis and uh, stable ischemic heart disease, CABG is recommended to improve survival, but uh, you, PCI is also a reasonable option. So this is where the informed decision comes in place and then the decision needs to be made by the heart team. Uh, the same thing in multivessel uh, coronary artery disease. If it involves three major coronary arteries and the anatomy is suitable for CABG, you can consider CABG to improve the survival. If not, if the patient is having uh, the same multivessel disease anatomy, the usefulness of PCI is uncertain, but uh, it's again a patient's choice. Now coming to single or double vessel disease not involving the proximal LAD. Uh, if the proximal LAD is not involved, if the patient is only stable ischemic heart disease, medical management can always be tried. So this is just the sequence of the same events which I just mentioned. And as recommended, if at all, uh, du uh, the dual antiplatelets have to be given uh, post-PCI, at least up to one year, and then the ischemic and thrombotic benefit needs to be considered. But if at all patient has issues with not con able to continue DIPT and all that stuff, then CABG is a little preferable option for in view of patients. Uh, so, uh, so this is just a case scenario. So here we have two patients. Uh, both presenting with multivessel or triple vessel coronary artery disease. The first patient, the syntax code is only 21, and the second patient, the syntax code is 52. So here I'm just trying to stress on the thing that patient presenting with triple vessel disease or left main with triple vessel disease doesn't essentially mean that they have to be referred only for CABG. We have to calculate the risk scores, also give the patient an informed choice, and then the decision needs to be made. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Radhapriya, to please remain on stage. And uh, the question and answer session now. So any questions from the audience? 